This conference will now be recorded. Well, good morning again, and welcome to our, our I want to say it's the 10th or so free training we've done for Forms Viewer. Uh, we try to do these two or three times a year, and the last one we did was in January, so it's been quite a while since we we have done one. And in the meantime, we have shipped a new version of Forms Viewer. We actually have another version 4.2 coming out any day now uh, with new features. We are not covering those new features in this uh, Forms Your training class, but um, we uh, we do have webinars that we've recently done on the new features. And I'll talk briefly about those new features coming in 4.2, uh, probably at the end of day four. Uh, this is a, a four-day class. We're running um, about two and a half, two to two and a half hours each day. So we're trying to get out by the end of uh, your, well, I guess 1 p.m. Eastern. It, it, it can go a little longer if you, we'll be here to, to help you with labs if you want to stick around for another hour. The, the formal duration is three hours, uh, and that last hour is really meant for labs. If you want, if you have time to do the labs while we're here, then you've got us to support you while you do them. Otherwise, you can take those away and do them later um, and watch the videos again. Um, so. Thanks again for being here and welcome. Um, this is our summer theme slide deck. Our goals this week are, uh, many of you are returning customers and there's, a, there's I think there's three or four of you that are new and that haven't been to a training class before. And um, you know, our goal is to introduce Forms Your and the new features that we've launched in 4.1 uh, to talk about um, why it is one of the key solutions in your toolkit moving forward for your forms. Um, and also to provide trainings to help to show you what's possible. There's a lot of stuff that we've done in webinars that we're going to show techniques. We've made uh, labs, hands-on labs, to make it easy for you to actually go through and apply the same techniques to your forms. And, um, and then also we're here to answer any questions that you have. This is a great forum to just bug us about any questions you're having whatsoever. It doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to correspond to any class content. You can just ask us if you're having trouble with your form. We will do ad hoc support for you during this class, um, typically after the demos and after we've done the presentation. Um, so hopefully you can all hear me okay. Kirby, how's the audio? Yeah, I can hear you okay, Patrick. <laughs> so my name is Patrick, and I'm <laughs> the chief project manager here. Uh, Qdabra is, uh, has been around since uh, September of 2003, so we're coming up on our 16-year anniversary, and I'm really happy that we've uh, we've had such a, a consistent uh, team over the years. We um, Joanne's been with us for over 10 years. Joanne, it's amazing that it's been 11 years now almost. And um, and Don, you've been with us um, going on six now. <laughs> and Kirby's relatively new. But um, but yeah, we've been doing this a long time, and uh, we're really happy to have you here too. I know a lot of our customers on the call. Um, or have been here with us for uh, many, many years. And we'll ask you to introduce yourself uh, very briefly in a moment. But first, I want to introduce our team. Um, so, so I'm kind of the, the founder of the AK, the chief project manager here. We're a small team of about a dozen resources that have uh, been working with Microsoft SharePoint technologies and other technologies over the years. We serve about 700 customers in the last 18 months. So. Um, and some of those customers are just buying Q rules or buying a simple tool from us. Other customers we're doing large projects for. Uh, so we, we do get a lot of stuff done, even though we only have 12 people. Um, we also build accelerators. So we build tools that help you um, make the most out of your investment in SharePoint. And, and this for accelerator that we're talking about today forms your, we started this work, I'll talk more about it in a second, but it's been now five years, almost six years since we actually started the development of Forms Viewer. Um, over those years, we've had lots of features. It is really a tool for you to be able to continue using your forms and extend them, and I'll talk more about that in a second. I want to introduce our team. Um, Joanne, you want to go first? Hello, everyone. So I'm Joanne Tendan. I'm with Kidabra uh, in 2008, and I, I I started working at InfoPath since then. I 
I typically I would work uh, as a tester in Kadabra. I test our main products, DBXL, QRules, and now Forms Viewer. So I'm just very happy to bring you this uh, Forms Viewer training content, and uh, uh, we hope we can uh, share something and uh, you can learn something, or learn more about how to use uh, this Forms Viewer Forms Viewer tool. So yeah, welcome to the training class. Happy to be here. Thanks, Joanne. Do I Don? Hello everyone, so my name is Don Frack and I am a support engineer here at Kidabra. I've been with the uh, company for about six years now and um, my strong suit as a uh, forms developer is prim primarily uh, on, on Infopath dashboards but mostly it depends on what the clients are asking for and I also help out with support, documentations, webinars and training. Great to have you here, John. Kirby? Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Forms Viewer training. So my name is Kirby Laborte. So I've been working for Kadabra for almost a year now, and um, I'm, the, I'm currently the customer support lead in Kadabra, and I'm also helping, usually helping with um, products testing. We're testing our DBXL Forms Viewer. And I'm also helping uh, with um, trainings like this one. So, yeah. And I'm sorry to interrupt your favorite hobby. I know it's late there in, yeah. in the Philippines. <laughs> but um, my, my hobby, for those of you who are wondering why I don't have a slide here, I, I'm sorry, I should put my picture on here as well. I'm not as beautiful as these people. But um, my favorite hobby is running, um, which is uh, what I'm working on right now for the I try to run the marathon once a year. It's tough, though, getting older. Um, I want to just go around the table and quickly um, ask you to introduce yourself. Um, where are you from? Um, how long have you been building forms? Um, how long have you been using Forms Viewer? How many forms have you created? It, you know, you can just give rough numbers if you want. Um, and, and I guess the most important question is this last question here, which is what do you help, hope to get out of the class this week? Uh, I'm just going to go top down. Um, Barack, you're number one in the list at the top there. Do you, do you mind uh, um, you, unmuting yourself and, and being the first uh, one up to introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I could do that. <laughs> uh, I'm Brock. I'm in uh, Minnesota uh, in the United States. I've been building an info path for probably five years. Um, how many forms have I created? Uh, oh man, I've never thought about it. A whole bunch. <laughs> um, how long have you been using Forms Viewer? I'd say it's been almost two years. Um, and this week I hope to um, learn some good tips and tricks um, and some, you know, you know, learn how to do a few things that would really help me out with uh, some forms. <laughs> And yeah, that's great. This is your first training class, right? Yes, it is. Yep. Awesome. Great, great, great to have you here. And I think you deserve, you have the distinction of being the only person I know that actually has a LinkedIn profile that says you're a Forms Your Developer. <laughs> Thank you for the, the shout out there. Well, thanks. There's a lot of, I concentrate on it a lot. <laughs> Great to have you here. Um, and uh, thanks for going first. Uh, Caroline, you've been in a class before with us. Um, I don't know if this is number two or number three. Maybe if, if you count the other classes we've done, it's 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 over two. Do you, do you mind uh, going second? I don't mind. My name is Caroline Beeman. I'm in Missouri. I have been building InfoPath forms for probably 13 years. I've created dozens and dozens of forms. Um, which is why I'm so happy that Forms Viewer came along so that I don't have to learn a completely new technology. I took this class a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half ago um, for the first time, and then I got pulled away from Forms Viewer uh, and haven't really worked with it for quite some time, so I'm hoping that this week to, um, to use this week's class as a refresher. That's great. Thanks. It's great to have you here. We've, we've changed the content dramatically since the last time you took it, but not dramatically since January. We've got four or five new things that we've done, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be different for you and a great refresh. Um, 
I know that you're on-prem, and I think, Brock, you're also on-prem. I probably should have added that question here if you're on-prem or online. It might be worth mentioning. There are slight differences, uh, some benefits to both, and uh, I'm not going to go into detail on those, but um, thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, Chris, this is your first class, right? There's two Chris's here, but yeah, this is my first class, uh, Chris Forrest uh, from uh, Washington State. Uh, I've been building InfoPath forms for seven and a half, eight years, probably 40, 45 or so. Um, been using Form Sewer for, I don't know, maybe like two months. You guys just got to start it on that. We've been yeah. engaged with you guys pretty predominantly. And uh, I just... Uh, like to get actual intro on how to really use Forms Viewer to see how we can leverage that in, uh, cool. in our business. Yeah, that's great. And uh, um, yeah, thanks. Sorry for, for not realizing that Chris Miller is also on the call. Chris, uh, you've been on, and, and Chris Forrest, you're like online, so it's uh, you don't you have been on prem, but you're just recently moving online, or at least you're in process of doing that. Um, Chris Miller, you've been here. Uh, on-prem with us now for, I want to say it's two or three years. Uh, how are things going today in New York? Uh, you know, New running around crazy like usual. Um, uh, my name is Chris Miller. Um, uh, we're over in Jersey. Um, uh, we've been using uh, InfoPath uh, for several years, probably since, you know, uh, 2007 Rome. Um, different flavors, you know, um, Almost all of it's been, you know, on-prem type uh, building. Um, we do software as a service, so uh, we've been, uh, you know, selling that end of it and, you know, moved to Forms Viewer because of the InfoPath, uh, uh, you know, issues uh, with them going away from InfoPath. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping to continue my education because, you know, you don't use it, you lose it. Um, type of deal um you know uh you guys have helped us dramatically in in you know increasing our use of these forms um you know in in multitudes of ways and i, I you know i need to know how to do all this stuff so that I, you know i don't have to use you guys as a crutch every day well, it's great to have you here again and uh, thanks for those wonderful comments about um how we've helped you um uh, let's see, uh, Justin, this is your first class, uh, and you're joining us from the Detroit area, right? That's correct. Uh, I have zero InfoPath experience. I have zero Forms Viewer experience. Uh, as the infrastructure manager, uh, SharePoint falls under my purview, and unfortunately, I don't have a SharePoint administrator right now. So just trying to understand uh, how InfoPath and Forms Viewer work together get a better idea of it uh, we've I've worked with your developers to have them help resolve some of our issues and update some of our forms uh, I think it'll just help if I understand how it all works together better so I can communicate with you better that's great to have you here uh, Shane a long long time you've been on forms here for three or four years now is that right <clears throat> yeah we were part of I think I was part of the the, the beta or just as it was rolling out is when I got involved in Forms Viewer. Um, so I've been around a long time. I've been developing for almost 10 years or building InfoPath forms for almost 10 years. And uh, I also am from the Detroit area. And uh, I've been in a couple of these classes before, but I know that there's some new features that have come out. So I'm looking forward to seeing those and just getting a refresher on everything. Cool. Great to have you here. And Sri, this is your first class as well, right? Uh, yes, Patrick. Uh, this is my first class. I'm uh, Sri Shastri. Um, I live in, I mean, I work in Auburn Hills, Michigan. I've been building about 20, 25 forms, um, InfoPath forms. I'm basically, um, I, I work a lot on ASP.NET applications uh, programming. And um, so with InfoPath, roughly like six to seven years of uh, experience, especially um, Qdabra has been really great, uh, very very helpful uh, when when I really really needed it, and uh, um, I've been I have some experience using DBXL uh, and a little bit more a little bit of experience in Power Apps too. Um, so I'm here. This is my first class. 
uh, new to Farms Viewer and You, what do you what what's your your number one thing you want to take away from the class today, Shri? We lost audio. Kari, can you still hear me? Yes, Patrick. Hello. Okay. Can you oh, hear Shri, me? Yeah, yeah. Your audio dropped for just that, at the very end there. Just uh, I don't know if you can repeat okay. the last thing you said. <laughs> That'd be okay. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I think I I probably got it. Okay, looks like maybe okay. you yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm new to Forms View here and um I'm here to learn how to use it and probably how to do um start with connecting to external data and hopefully I get my, uh, quite a bit of today's class and, and this week's class. Well, thanks for being here. I really mm -hmm. look forward to presenting to all of you and um that we're gonna make this thing go quickly, obviously. Um Let's do a quick recap. So why 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 do we provide forms here? Um, the the main thing is to provide a replacement for InfoPath. Uh, people have been worried about uh, Microsoft's uh, sunsetting of InfoPath for many many years now. The the good news is that they keep rolling back the date. Uh, that the date now is spring 2026, which is when they're going to stop supporting the designer. That's an official um, statement from Microsoft that they will stop supporting the InfoPath designer in about seven years, which, um, you know, it used to be 2023 and then it was 2025 and, and then they moved it back even further. Um, one of the challenges Microsoft has is that people keep using InfoPath because it's free and it's available. It's got a WYSIWYG editor. Uh, you can do things in InfoPath um, that still require code in Power Apps. Uh, you don't have to write code in InfoPath. You can write rules. Uh, we do have an extensibility framework in Forms here so that if you want to write JavaScript, you can do that. I think, Barack, you've done some of that already. Um, so, so Power Apps is really this Microsoft roadmap thing out there. We are Power Apps certified professionals as well. We've done um, a couple dozen Power Apps solutions for customers. And it is a great solution for new forms that are relatively simple. If you've got existing forms, you know, any more than five or 10, or they're very complex forms, we provide forms here to you as a, as a sort of a solution. But it's also um, a, one of the ways in which you can add new features to your forms without having to recreate them from scratch. Um, obviously, we want to keep your forms fresh for the future. And so we've been adding new, new technology. So we've been adding things like Smartphone authentication, um, the ability to print PDF. Um, there's just countless things we've added over the years. You're, you're going to see quite a few of them in today's class and in this week's class. We'll, we'll talk about a lot of cool techniques that we've added that, that aren't in Power Apps, like you know, the, just the ability to take a photograph and upload it to a library. You can't do that in Power Apps without writing code. They're trying to work on a codeless solution this year. That was one of their big topics in the, um, in the Inspire conference uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but but still today, doing simple things in Power Apps does require a little bit of, you know, macro or more level uh, coding in, in Power Apps. Plus, say you've got to rewrite your forms, you've got to actually create um, users, and you've got to pay Microsoft. Um, Microsoft's pricing has changed recently. They're still including Power Apps in the, P, in the E3 license, um, but it's not inexpensive if you don't have an E3 license. It's it's actually now going to be 40 bucks per user per month starting in October. There's still some confusion about the cost structure there. We're trying to get some clarity for you. We have a webinar next week on the differences between Flow and Logic Apps because they also announced pricing for Flow would change in October. So, you know, there's some uncertainty with Microsoft about the future and about what they're going to, you know, how, how much they're going to charge for Power Apps and Flow and whether they're going to change the cost over time. You know, rest assured that we do charge for online usage of Forms here because we have to pay Microsoft for the Azure instances that we're running, but we're not going to increase our pricing um, for you. We're going to keep it fixed at what it is um, and, you know, guaranteed for five years. I mean, obviously, we can't guarantee it for infinitely because Microsoft might change Azure pricing, but, um, we're going to be here to give you the lowest cost option in terms of the uh, total cost, which means you know, no migration costs or minimal migration cost, no rewrite cost. And then we're going to basically have Forms here is a per tenant or a per install, you know, SharePoint farm level thing. It's not going to be per user. It's not going to be 
of something that is um, it's going to be an order or two orders of magnitude cheaper than Power Apps. Uh, so that's our goal with with Forms here, and then of course to provide you with uh, you know un, um, incomparable. That was the right word I want to use. The uh, you know, support level of support that you wouldn't get anywhere else. Um, and we we pride ourselves on being uh, very responsive to our customers, and hopefully. You've had that experience. Um, so just quickly, I want to just share a couple of slides that we've talked about in the past, but um, the idea with Formsier is to not just replace your forms um, with a technology that's gonna be there for you, but also to, to allow you to add new features. And, and some of those new features are on this slide. Uh, modernizing the layout with uh, CSS is very easy to do. You'll see that in the first or the second lab today. Um, it's adding, uh, taking the repeating data and, and mapping it to a list and then refreshing it. If the list changes, we'll show that as well today. Uh, we'll show you how to upload attachments to a library and replace them with links tomorrow. We'll generate a PDF and show you how to do that today. Um, and then we will we'll show emails with one-click approvals uh, using um, passing parameters so that when they click on a link, it's actually passing a parameter to a form that says user equals one, two, three and using that information to quickly approve things. We've done a, a number of webinars on this. You'll see a webinar tomorrow where we use um, SMS text authentication. Um, actually, there's an app we authenticate with, and it also allows you to quickly send a, a link to somebody to approve something, and because we know they're using their cell phone, uh, we don't even ask them to log in if they respond within 90 seconds. So you'll see that tomorrow uh, with our Authy, our Authy demo. And there's more features. We'll we'll show you dashboards um, on. I think dashboards is going to, going to be on Thursday. Um, obviously, we'll we'll show you how to. Uh, we've got a demo we've done before where we take an image and we extract it, send it to Google, and um, do optical character recognition on it so we can search for the text in the image. Um, you know, obviously we'll do the SMS text thing tomorrow, and then um, overlays will be on Friday. And there's a bunch of other things we're going to talk about as well. In fact, here's kind of a rough overview of of the entire class this week. Um, we'll show you how to enable the modern UI. Some of you have forms you don't have the modern UI in them, so they're they're classic SharePoint libraries. We'll show you how to enable modern UI. That's going to be in the first, I believe that's in the first demo that we're going to do in a, a few moments, Joanne. You're going to be enabling modern, is that correct? Yes, that's included in the deployment process. Um, one of the nice features about Forms here is if, for those of you who have used Curls in the past, Curls is a library of commands that we built to extend InfoPath Forms. There's about 160 different commands. Forms here includes the 70, well, 60 or 70 commands that are most common. A lot of the Curls commands are math functions. We have people that use InfoPath Forms. Um, we had people that use InfoPath Forms to do complex calculations for uh, financial calculations. So we didn't move those over yet, but pretty much everything else um, is is moved over. And we've actually had a few new things in Forms Zero version of QRules that you won't find in the regular version. Um, and what, we'll show, I think, one or two of those today. We've got a, a new command that, um, I'm trying to think of the the difference. We might have backported that to the QRules uh, library as well. But but anyway, if you've got QRules in your form, you don't have to worry. Those All those commands will move over just fine. Um, I'm just assuming you're not using the weird math functions, which I don't think anybody's using, um, except maybe a couple of people. Um, the security is a big issue and also allowing external access to your forms. And this is really the whole goal of this uh, this third bullet here to, to show you that how to use your, your phones to authenticate users. Some of you may say, no, we don't want to do that. That's fine. But but it is a really interesting vector uh, because um, it's, a, it's an opportunity to save money to have people that are not necessarily uh, authenticated users in SharePoint be authenticated using their phones. And that adds security because they don't have a password. No one can hack it. And you're only giving them access when you want to. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and we'll do demo um, the lab on, uh, I think tomorrow is a big focus, focal point is going to be that security, that Authy. And those codes, those, those six digit codes that we use for authentication are generated on a server, so there's no way they can hack those codes from their browser. Um, and, uh, and then um, we'll add, today we'll also show, actually it's tomorrow, we'll show you a lab that um, adds a whole bunch of features to your form, and, and we've kind of, 
included all of the, the sort of the standard things into what we call an FV controls or reusable template part. So if you've got a form and you want to quickly upgrade it to add change history, this uploading of attachments and admin section uh, and suggestion boxes and other things, we've got a, a easy way to do that. We've also, we've also split out the dynamic data connections into a separate XTP, an XML template part, a reusable piece that you can add to every form. One of the most common upgrades that, that we see with people going to Form Zero is making those data connections dynamic. And the benefit to you is that you can move your forms from, from dev to production without changing anything. The data connections automatically sense where the form is published and it automatically queries the, the site where the form lives. And I know that a lot of you have forms that have already done that. Um, I know Justin, you know, we did, did dynamic data connections for the engineering request form. And then there are other, um, you know, I think, Chris, uh, Chris Miller, you've got those, and Chris Forrest, you do too, and you're in the forms that we built for you. So we're pretty much adding that dynamic, that dynamicity um, to every form that we come across that, that we upgrade to forms here. And so we'll show that t tomorrow. Um, we'll show you, yeah, Don will be demoing how to do dashboards to highlight overdue items. It's a, a great technique. You can use forms here to create a simple dashboard, a view that, that allows people to filter and see things. And then we'll, share with you some bonus topics. There's a lot of really cool things you can do to show overlays and pop-ups that you couldn't do in InfoPath. Um, I think one question everyone might have is what about the designer? Well, we're working on the designer. We've actually started development on it. We hope to have a, a version of the designer out by the end of the year. Um, and it will then essentially, once we have the designer done, it may take us another year to sort of get it from beta to complete. but by the time Microsoft stops supporting it, which is a few years down the road, we'll have a fully functional designer in the browser that you'll be able to use, and so you won't have to worry about any info path at all. Um, and hopefully that will start at the beginning end of this year. That's our goal anyway. So you all have audio, that's great. Um, you need to have your Forms Your App installed either on on-prem or 365, I think everyone does. Um, so I think everyone's set for the class and uh, what we'll be providing to you, and I think you, you should have already received um, a link, Kirby sent out an email earlier about an hour ago with, um, with the labs for, for today, day one labs. At the end of the day today, we'll send you the video and we'll also be showing you how to do the demos of the labs. So our, our six demos today will essentially parallel the labs that we give you. So you've got these hands-on labs. We spent a lot of time creating PDFs and testing them to make sure that you have good training material that you can use and you can use it in the class after the demos and we'll be here to answer questions or you can take it home and you can do it later and, and ask us questions later. Uh, obviously, if you have questions during the demos, please don't hesitate. I think we have, maybe we have some questions already. We've got a chat here going. I need to look at this. Um, and, uh, I guess is this a question or not? I'm just looking here. I heard 2019 SharePoint is not going to be on-prem. Is that true? Um, so that's a great great example of a question on the fly, Chris. Sorry, I just caught that. But uh, right now, 2019 uh, on-prem exists. It is not going away in 2019. We have customers that have upgraded to it. So the answer is no, it's not true. But there is no InfoPath support in 2019. There is in 2016. So if you've got 2019 on-prem, you definitely want to have forms your Form Zero works even if you don't have SharePoint. We added a feature over a year ago to allow you to run Form Zero on forms without SharePoint or with SharePoint Foundation. Um, you can use Active Directory uh, to log users in or use your cell phone to authenticate. So there's some options there. But yes, 2019 um, is definitely uh, the first on-prem version that doesn't have InfoPath, and um, but it does. There is an on-prem install for that. So just yeah, feel free to ask questions when you have them. We will be uh, doing a quick quiz at the beginning of each day, not today, but we'll do one tomorrow. And basically we'll just refresh ourselves on what we learned the previous day. And um, any questions for me before we get started with the demos? So just to recap for today, we're going to be showing you how to deploy a sample form to your site. Uh, the first three demos Joanna's going to be doing. We'll take a break after she's done her demos, hopefully within about 30 minutes. And um, and then Kirby will start up again 10 minutes later, about 9.15 Pacific or 12.15 uh, Eastern. 
and we'll finish the demos with uh, she's got three demos she's going to be doing and there's actually a new a new piece so it's like three and a half demos um, that she'll be doing and today we're really kind of covering the basics uh, we're going to show how to do how to deploy a form to forms you using uh, this is a good overview demo the first one will show you how to take a, a form that you might have and just deploy it we're going to show the modern UI because I know a lot of the online customers have that now and they really want to focus on modern because of it, it performs better it's it's got better look and feel on on mobile um, devices so we'll do that then we'll show how to add a responsive UI to the form so that the form actually looks good on mobile with with minimal change and then uh, Joanne will also show how to map repeating data to a list this is probably the most common feature we get from time to time for forms is I've got this repeating data how do I get it out of the form so we'll show you how to do that quickly and then uh, we'll show how to improve the usability of the form by adding buttons to a table so you can add and re remove things without having to find the widget that's kind of an esoteric demo but it's really useful and we uh, we highly recommend adding buttons to forms to make it easier for your users uh, then Kirby will show how to generate a PDF this is like a one one line command that you add to your forms it's really simple but you can also do it for list forms. So list forms tend to have only the item that you're editing, but you can pull in all of the other list data and you can create a nice printout of repeating data, even from a list form, and we'll show you how to do that. And then finally, uh, we'll finish up with a very, co very um, popular topic, which is this, for successive submits, do you wanna have the ability to quickly submit and submit again, you know, submit and clear, save and new, whatever you wanna call it. We'll show you how to do that. There's a very simple way to, to add that to your form. Any questions on today's content? So, so it's very easy to install and configure forms here. Um, we're going to do the demo next. So Joanne, I'm gonna make you presenter and we'll just have you walk through it. And then if anyone has any questions whatsoever, we, we did get another um, attendee. I want to welcome, um, our 12th attendee here, and who is that? It is, uh, I guess someone's lurking in the background maybe, but um, we, have 12, we, we have one more person than we did before, but I don't know who it is. <laughs> so it must be that we had the 12 people before and I just didn't realize it. So so uh, Joanne, I'm gonna make you presenter, and, um, and uh, but, but anyone, if you have questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to just jump in unmute yourself and ask a question. We are recording this, um, so hopefully uh, um, yeah, if, you, if you feel comfortable asking a question, please do. If, if not, you can always use the chat window. Joanne? Yes, so we'd like to start off with the basic. Um, first is Forms Viewer app installation for those who, who's just uh, seeing Forms Viewer for the first time, would like to, to show you how you can install the Forms Viewer app to your uh, 365 site print site. Um, so previously, when installing Forms Viewer, users would typically deploy the, the app file manually in the app catalog site. So we ask them to, to upload the, the file here in the apps for SharePoint page and uh, the SharePoint admin would go in and approve it. And once it's approved, it, it's going to be available in the tenant site. But uh, now that we launched the Forms Viewer app in the SharePoint store, you can now search uh, for the app in the SharePoint store. Let me quickly show you that. And once you find the app, just uh, click on it. and click add it and it will be available to your site for installation and ideally we we really want for you to to have access to it to this add it button but the current release version that we have requires a little bit of uh, approval process from your sharepoint administrator and uh, that is because the forms viewer app requests permission to the user profile store so I'm just scrolling, scrolling down here in the uh, documentation guide here. 
So if you search for the app and you're seeing this message, your tenant administrator has to approve this app. Just click on request approval and then the request will uh, go into the, the app request and then have your administrator uh, approve the request and then it will be available. But like I mentioned a few weeks from now, when we release the, the latest version, you no longer have to go through that approval process and you can just click add it. All right, so uh, I will just show you how to install FormsUver from this uh, site. I don't have it here yet, but I can add it. So click trust it. And it's currently installing. It's actually, uh, for me, uh, a one minute process. So let's just wait for that to install. Every time you ask questions, you ask questions at this point. Um, so, and we are, you know, we have an update for the SharePoint App Store coming, right, Joanne, with slightly different UI. We've updated the UI in the App Store to make the icon look better and a bunch of other things. We got some images in there that we're, we're making look better in the app store. So there will be a, it will look slightly different. You won't have that blue um, dog here on the right there um, or, or dog ear shadow um, coming in a couple weeks. We'll have the 4.2 version out. And I guess the question for you, Joanne, is, is by, by taking out that get user profile stuff, did that, um, does, it, does that mean they can't use the um, user profile service? No, uh, we we modify the the get uh, user profile by name to to query it from a, a different list. I think Jimmy had it query from a different list, so it still it will still work. I knew that. I just wanted to ask you. <laughs> so <that laughs> I've been wondering. Um, so we have. A, I think we have a question from. Uh, my version of Forms here has the old icon. Is there any issue with having an older version? This is from Shane. Do you want to answer that? Uh, Forms viewer has an old icon. I think uh, if you can, if, if you install Forms viewer previously, just like I mentioned, if you were uploading it manually, you can just uh, replace it here in the apps for SharePoint. And uh, you can get the, the latest uh, package. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Shane, you can continue using it as is, or you can upgrade. Um, there's really, I don't think there's a huge difference. I think there might be a few things like that. You get user profile service that required uh, special stuff before, it doesn't require it anymore. Uh, Joanne, can you think of anything else that might have changed in the last year for the app? Um, no, so far, uh, I don't think so. Um, um, except for uh, the QRules command, new QRules command that we've added and some uh, enhancements in the designer page. Great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, as you can see, I don't have access to manage templates. It's because I'm not uh, a site and administrator in this uh, site. So you might want to to edit your permission and add yourself or have your admins add you add you as a site collection administrator so once you are a site collection admin you'll be able to access the manage templates page so there you go i have it here so I'm guessing most of you are already familiar in how to use this Manage Templates page. You'll just go and upload a new template. And if you already have that package that we sent you earlier this morning, uh, just to use this expense report form that, that is the, the template that we're going to use for this demo. And by the way, this is a this is like a replacement of uh, publishing from uh, InfoPath Designer. 
Has anyone of you used the uh, file publish uh, to SharePoint? Uh, th that allows you to, to publish a form template to library and we, we replace that by just simply dragging your form template to, to this uh, upload new template page and then just uh, click upload. And it's just a, a two second process for me and it's already added in my templates page. Now it's rendering the form in the browser. Okay, so um, after you've installed the forms viewer app in the, in the site where you want to use it, um, the next uh, part for the deployment process is to install the forms viewer uh, extensions config file. And uh, that is another file that we provided you um, in the Forms Viewer extensions. We have uh, here the latest Forms Viewer extensions file and you'll just, uh, or your SharePoint admin could uh, take this file for you, or if you're an admin, you can do it yourself and, and uh, upload it in apps for SharePoint. And once it's available in, in the tenant site, you can uh, go to pages click site page and by the way the forms viewer extensions config is uh, a tool that we use to uh, for you to be able to open the form template uh, in Forms Viewer in your form libraries or, or list. So I'm just uh, showing you how to set it up here. Okay, and uh, click the plus icon and search for Forms Viewer. Click on that. And then click the pencil button here. Close that. And uh, here you were. You will enter the forms you were uh, URL, and uh, just go back to. I don't know. switching over to my site I lost my link um, okay uh, once you were here so this is the link that you need the link to the starter page then paste it here and then click publish this is the extension is key for people with modern UI right if they have a classic library they're going to use a different technique right yes mm -hmm. they, they can also use the the js like format when you, when they're on classic mode mm, okay so and then after that you're set you should have a, a form library where you can uh, associate to to uh, uh, a form template in your uh, forms you were uh, let me just quickly switch back to to the actual training site here because that's uh, the new site that I'm showing you. It's a fresh 365 site. So in this heavy extensions config, I have already configured some of the library to open in Forms Viewer. So for example, I select the expense report library. Uh, 
I, I would recommend selecting all of these check boxes. This just these are just the column columns for SharePoint that uh, you want to replace as links for Forms Viewer. And then this is that uh, Forms Viewer URL that you just configured uh, earlier. And then uh, here you will enter the the template name. So it should be the exact template name um, that you have in uh, Forms Viewer. So just copy that template name that you want to associate to the library and paste it here and then click apply changes. And it also shows a log saying it's uh, successful and finished saving. All right, so uh, I think that's uh, the major part for the deploy deployment process. The, the two major parts are installing from Sewer and uh, uh, from Sewer extensions config. And uh, once, uh, once you're done with that, you can uh, grab the SDPs that we provided you and create the libraries and lists based off this SDPs. So you will go to your root site, uh, click site settings, list templates, files, and uh, upload the STPs here. And I've already uploaded that. Um, so this three. So once it's available as list templates to, to your site, you can uh, go to your site contents, Click new app, then search for for the STPs that you just added, and you have to to add them one by one. And we recommend not to to rename it, so just use the exact name for for each custom list and uh, library. Then click create. So I don't have to do that because I, I already have them in uh, in this site. Joanne, can you show them what the, um, the links look like on the new, when they apply the FE extensions? If you can go to that, that lab one where you actually applied it, can you show them what the links look like when the FE extensions work and how they can tell if it, if it worked correctly? I mean, obviously the FE extensions app said it was successful, but can, can you actually go into the list or the library and show the, how the links are changed? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was going to, I was thinking I was going to, to show that in lab one, but, uh, um, so this is the report, okay. expense report. Okay. <laughs> okay. If, you, if you want to just switch, we can take a quick break here and just recap, and then you can show them in lab one. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, we do have yeah, one no question problem. from Sri. We do have one question from Sri, though. Actually, two questions. Um, at what level in the hierarchy should the uh, Forms Your Package be installed? Is it site collection level, and will all subsites have access? And I believe the answer is yes. You want to apply it to a site collection, and then the any sites underneath that can add the app. Um, then your next question is, should I add the FD app to every subsite uh, to be able to use it? So I think there's a diff couple different patterns here. We actually have a document on how to structure your SharePoint sites that we'll be providing to you. Um, we're actually using, we were creating a document for a couple other customers, and I can, um, send you a preview of the document today maybe, but but there are different um, structures that you want to use, obviously for online and for on-prem, depending on on your business and how you're and how you're using SharePoint. But in general, I think that um, certainly um, you don't need to necessarily, I mean, you, you can either create one site collection where all your forms live, kind of, this is kind of a, a centralized model, 
and then and then have the other sites point to it. Or you can have each site can have its own uh, app. The difference is that if you have multiple form designers, if you have lots of people that are going to be changing the forms in the future, you probably want the latter. The, the first approach to centralize is, is a good approach if you just have a few people that are modifying the forms. Um, and we'll talk more about that, but it's, it's kind of a, a more complex question, Sri, about how to structure SharePoint. But depending on how you structure it, you'd either install the FD app in one site collection or multiple. And I'll, I'll send a, a doc, I'll take a note to send you the, the document we have on best practices for structuring SharePoint. I know you're already somewhat of a pro at that, but we do have a, a new document we're providing for a couple of customers, and, and if you're interested, I'll do. I'll send that. Um, and so I guess, uh, uh, Joanne, before we switch to, to the next demo, did you want to say anything more about this one? Do you want to do a quick recap? Oh, um, oh I just want to to add more to to that. Uh, if if you deploy the Form Server extension, it will ask you to. Uh, if you want to make this solution available to all sites in the organization, and if you select this uh, checkbox, then it will be available to to uh, all sites then under that site collection. So you can apply uh, the the Forms Viewer extension to a hierarchy of sites. So also, I, I wanted to add that uh, we have a uh, we, we have a, implemented a command to, to make the data connections dynamic. So if you can see the, the form template that we provided is pointing to, to a different site. Um, yeah, the data connections here are pointing to, to a different site, but if you use this form template and deploy that to, to your own site, it will automatically modify the a data connection URL on the fly, and uh, that is because uh, we have a. Let me see if it's here. Um, we're using a command called get an input parameter and also change connection URL. So this one is uh, the one that's doing that. Um, so basically, you saw that uh, the site is different here. But uh, when we upload the form template in uh, Form Sewer, it automatically detects the site where you uh, uploaded it or where it lives. So it's now uh, changing the URL on the fly. And uh, yep, so that's uh, will make it easy for you if you are on prem and you're thinking about moving to, to 365, then um, that's less effort. So does this make sense? Yeah, it's also less effort if you're on-prem and they're just moving to a new on-prem install, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's because you've already right. included that in the expense report sample. They don't need to worry about fixing up the data connections, right? Yes, correct. Great. Well, that's a great first start. Let's just do a quick recap. I'm going to quickly share my screen again and just share okay. out a, a slide that does a summary, Joanne, and, and maybe um, – you or I can talk to this. I know we've we put together some summary slides here. Um, so that was demo number one, or actually zero. And the like Joanne was just mentioning, the pros here are that it's automatically detecting the current site, as you saw in the debug screen. So it's easy to set up. Um, so you'll install Forms here, the extensions app. Those are the two apps. Forms here can be installed from the SharePoint store. At some point in the future, we'll make Forms here extensions in the SharePoint store. But in the meantime, you've got it in the package that was sent this morning. You've also can download it from InfoPath Dev. If you um, if you want to do classic and not modern, we have a, another technique for classic, which involves uh, this FB links, and that's also a package you can download from the InfoPath Dev website. The STPs are required, so before you actually open the expense report, you're going to have to make sure you have the libraries and the lists already created, so make sure you upload those SCPs and create those those three list libraries before you try to open the expense report, because it's going to be querying for some of those, I think. Um, and then you're going to want to configure one the library that you create 
using FE extensions so that those links uh, show up correctly. So for, for demo number one, or demo the next demo, we're going to um, be once again asking Joanne to do a quick uh, demo here of the uh, how to map repeating data to lists. And, and Joanne, maybe don't worry too much about the refresh, you can just mention it, but we're, we wanna make sure that we're uh, keeping to our timeline here. So I'm gonna switch back to you and uh, any questions before we do the next demo? And Brock has a question. If we have an on-prem setup, should I try installing on 365? Uh, uh, yeah, you could do either one. I, either way, I think the on-prem, uh, there might be some limits to the modern UI, so the FE extensions probably won't work on on-prem. I guess we should have mentioned that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you want to create a, a test site on 365, that would be great. It would be a great example. I know that, Joanne, you did that as part of your testing. Or that's a new site, that QDSoft 365. You just set that up, right? Yes, that is a, a, a new site. Any other questions before we switch to the next demo? Okay, Joanne, back to you. Okay, so the the next lab is about submitting and uh, refreshing data to a list with a submit to SharePoint list command, and also the one that Patrick mentioned, refresh SharePoint list items. So let me just uh, fill out the expense report to demo how this works. Hmm. Just adding another item. Wait for that to submit, okay, and refresh our SharePoint lists. I think this is this is the one. So uh, you'll see that the data gets submitted, submitted to my expense reports list and my expense list item. Um, so this is the one that I just submitted a, uh, an hour ago, maybe. Um, so, so the way we set it up in order for you to submit data to your list is go to the forms designer Click the SharePoint list mappings. And here I already have a mapping configured. And uh, you'll see that I have here a mapping for my expense reports header data and also a sub level for my repeating items. And it's submitting to expense list items. And they are set up to, to submit to the SharePoint list and also this one. And uh, so here you, you just have to, to follow the document that we provided you. And uh, if it's your first time seeing this, you might be overwhelmed with what to, what to input here. But uh, what I recommend is uh, Just do it uh, one by one. Like for example, if it's your first time setting up the SharePoint list mappings, uh, just type in a mapping because uh, mapping is a 
the default name that we used for uh, the command. So just add top level mapping and then select the list where you want to submit your data. And in this case, I'm not submitting to, to a repeating item. I'm just selecting the base path there. And uh, so for example, I have a resource name column and just uh, going to complete. And as you can see, so on and so forth, and it automatically detects the, the data type as well. So uh, once you've set up the, the first mapping, your, your parent mapping, just to save it, it will inject a mapping to your form template. And just test if it submits to that parent list. And if it does, then uh, it's perfect. You can just go ahead and add your sub-level uh, sub mapping. And uh, for the sub-level mapping, it's usually uh, a repeating group. So that's what I have here. All right. And after you're, you're done with your mapping, just uh, click Save. And it will inject uh, the mapping to to your form template. Let's open the. Yeah, it's also in the resource file. I just want to show them that it's all also in InfoPath Designer here. Yep, this mapping file. And once you're done with that, uh, also, you you need to configure the the commands that we mentioned earlier. Uh, submit to SharePoint list is just very simple. I added a, an action I, uh, role here that uh, sets the command field to submit to SharePoint list, and that's it. Uh, so I want to briefly mention also that this form is also using a command for refreshing data. So that's in the finish loading under Qdaba rules, uh, secondary data source. And this is that command that that is updating the, the list item for your forms. So that uses the same <laughs> query the list and if something has changed, it updates it. Yeah, I, I, will, I just want to also want to uh, show them how, how it works. So if I want to edit this, like for example, the amount, it's a little bit higher. And uh, let's go back to the form library and open the XML. And it's also updated. So that's how refresh the items work. Can you work. show them the debug uh, area and show them where the command, what the command is doing? We have this nice debug help section. That if you click on the version at the bottom, I think we have that in this form, don't we? Yeah, great. Um, okay. mm -hmm. This one? Yeah, so it shows all the commands that have executed. Mm -hmm. So if you have an issue with the command not doing what you think it's doing, you can always click on that the version at the very bottom of the form to see. And if it doesn't say success here, there usually will be an error next to it that describes why it failed. Um, but this is a pretty simple command. Both of these commands, the submit SharePoint list and the refresh SharePoint list items don't have a ton of parameters. So it's unlikely that you'll, you'll have any problems there. That's great, Joanne. I really yeah. like how you showed how it worked first and then, and then showed them how to create it using the forms designer, which is one of the features in forms here is the ability to create these mappings in the browser UI. We're going to be updating that forms designer UI to make this look a little bit more 
clean and, and uh, modern. We're going to upgrade the update the UI here in the next next release, not 4.2, but 4.3, when we add the canvas layout editing ability. Is, is that it for this demo? Should we ask everyone for some quick feedback or questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great job. Um, we're just a little behind schedule, but we're doing well. So I'm just going to quickly share out my screen again. And so a quick recap of what we just saw. Um, so, oops, too far. Um, so the pros and cons. So why did we do this? Well, you want to be able to extract repeating data to um, the parent-child list so that you can do reporting on it using either Power BI or using Excel. So the benefit of extracting the repeating data is that you can actually create more um, dimensionality in your reports. Usually, you know, Empath is a great tool because 99% of all the forms that you use for business will have repeating data in them. So, for example, uh, you know, like if you have a invoice form, you're going to have multiple line items. If you have a timesheet, you'll have multiple line items. If you have an expense report, you'll have multiple line items. Pretty much every business report or every business form will have multiple items in it. And that's one of the benefits of InfoPath out of the box. Unlike Microsoft Forms, which is this new survey level kind of thing, or you know, it's like Google Forms, or even uh, tools like the uh, SurveyMonkey, um, they're typically linear. They don't have the ability to add repeating child data, but InfoPath does. And the, the problem, though, is that InfoPath and InformZero um, Forms your fixes this, but InfoPath didn't have the ability to extract that repeating data to, to child lists, so you couldn't actually, it was very difficult. So one of the first features we added to QRules for InfoPath was its ability to extract the child data, the list data, uh, to multiple um, levels of, of parent-child, you know, grandchild lists so that you can do reporting and have a, you know, three dimensions as opposed to just two um, in terms of your reports, which is huge. And Formzero, of course, supports that. Very easy to add it. You just go into the mapping tool in the Forms Designer part of Forms Viewer. You add the command, you set your mapping, you add the command, and then you can even refresh it when items change. Any questions on that? So, Joanne, back to you for quick quick demo number three here, or what we're calling demo number two, so, so it matches Lab 2. Yes, so Lab 2 is about creating mobile responsive forms with load resource commands. So uh, in this part, you will learn how to use the command load resource, and it's making use also of a, of a .css file. So for those of you who, who's, uh, uh, who like CSS, uh, you will enjoy uh, adding CSS style sheets to your forms viewer to make uh, beautiful forms. So this is just a CSS file that's basically uh, making the form mobile responsive. And uh, let me just quickly show you, going back to my image templates page and uh, this the one. Okay, uh, uh, let me just compare it so you can see the difference. So this is the, the first expense report form that we deploy that doesn't have the, the, the resource file for CSS. So it's not responsive, so you can see, but in this template where we added it, it's now, responsive and uh, dynamic and uh, it's also it looks uh, good in mobile too so that's why that's really useful so how do we add it um, just close that open this sample form It's uh, very easy to, to add. Uh, you just add uh, an action, a rule that loads the CSS file and uh, 
the command is load resource and the parameter would be this name parameter and then name of your CSS file. And so uh, we have a way to, to add it directly in the forms designer page. So you don't have to, to go into your info path form. Uh, so here's the manage resources and you can just add a new resource and select your, uh, your CSS, CSS style. Um, yeah. This one. Yeah. And as you can see, I already have added it there. So, um, well, I just want to, I, I have a, a, a background here that will, will change the back, background. So I, I want to show you how we can edit the CSS file and add the background while the form loads. Oh, let's try that. Let's see. We'd have to give a shout out to Miller at DCS because I think the CSS that we had in there had a reference to one of his sites in it. Did? Oh. So. Let's open it again. Oh. Are you sure you want that one? That one says 725. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I'll just place the one in my desktop. And I hope it works. Uh, and yeah, so, so you can see the image is loading. So while users are waiting for it to load, they, they have some uh, something to see in, in there. So that's just about it for, for the load resource and CSS. We can still improve it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the one really cool thing about that background image technique is that the very first time it opens, um, it you know it's going to pull the image down to the browser that the customer that the user is opening the form from, so it's slightly delayed, but not a huge amount depending on the size of the image. The next time they go to the site, that image is already cached on their browser, so they immediately see that slash screen, which is a really nice. Um, you know, perception-based kind of, you know, managing the perception, because everyone's using the cloud nowadays. So things take, you know, slightly longer to open things. They're not as fast as they used to be when everything was underneath your desk, uh, because it is, and in Joanne's case, she's pulling it down from from our uh, data centers, you know, from forms of your data centers in the United States, and she's in, in the Philippines, right? So it's, it's even going to be faster for you when you're doing the labs, because you're, Closer, there's less latency. I mean, not a huge amount of latency difference, but the world is very connected these days. Okay, so let's say, take a quick recap, then we're going to take a break. Um, and I want to thank Joanne for starting us off with these three wonderful demos. So quickly to recap, uh, adding this CSS to your form makes it look good, uh, regardless of the size of the of the browser, regardless of the the dots per inch resolution for your device, and you know if you're using one of these. Um, you know, retina level um, screens on an Apple iPad or something like that, the forms will look good on that. They'll look good on the Windows Surface um, uh, laptops and everything else that has, you know, 4K monitors, they'll look fine on those. The old InfoPath forms won't because it won't actually try to be responsive. 
So that's one of the techniques that we add to all of our forms now. We like to add the CSS to make the forms look good with the high DPI devices. It's really easy to do it. You can do it from the forms designer in Formsier, or you can do it in InfoPath Designer, and you just add that one command and you specify the CSS. Uh, Joanne, maybe we can show them um, that command in the command builder. It might be nice to also quickly introduce the command builder. I know you showed them showed the command builder earlier when you were uh, doing the submit to SharePoint list command, but do you want to just quickly show them how, how they can create the command themselves? I think your audio might be muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is the the command builder tab. So just click on that and uh, search for load resource. And this provides a little detail about the command. And we're looking for the required parameter, which is name, and then just type in styles.css. And that's it. Copy to clipboard. And uh, uh, go into rule editor, field rules, this one. Uh, select, go to cadaver rules, finish loading, confirm, and uh, so that, this is it. And you, you just paste it here and enclose it with double quotes. Great, thanks for that. And Awesome. Okay, so we're at our break, our first break. So I want to thank Joanne again for uh, those wonderful demos. We're going to do a 10-minute break here, so we'll come back around 9.31, East, sorry, not Eastern, Pacific. So it's 12.30 Eastern. I've got a mistake on this slide. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, we look forward to talking to you again. We're going to, um, after the break, we're going to uh, resume our demos. And Kirby, we're going to switch to Kirby, and she's going to show you three other techniques. So. Talk to you in about 10 minutes. This conference will now be recorded. And I'm going to switch Kirby to you. Anyone have any questions after the break? Do you want to? Uh, we we just demoed Joanna just demoed how to deploy Forms here with Forms here extensions. She showed how to map repeating data to a list, and, and then she finally showed how to make your forms responsive at the end with the load resource command. And now Kirby's up, and Kirby, you're going to do another three demos, uh, starting with, uh, I think we should do a quick summary of the techniques again. You're going to show insert and delete using buttons, right? And yeah. then you're going to show how to uh, create a PDF using a command that we have, render form command, and, mm -hmm. and also show kind of a, an adjunct to that, a new a new way to do it with list forms. And then finally, we're going to close with, a way to um, submit and clear out the form so they don't have to reopen it over and over again. They can just use the same form to submit multiple versions. Is that right? Yep, correct. Wonderful. Okay. You're on. Thanks. Okay, so uh, for this lab three, uh, I'm going to share with you a technique on replacing the default InfoPath widgets for adding or deleting repeating rows with a more user-friendly approach. So here's um, the form that uh, Joanne used in our previous lab. So as you can see here, we have our expense items that are um, also within the repeating group in our form. So I know that most of you are already familiar with uh, these InfoPath widgets here the blue one. So as you can see, it allows you to insert items before the current um, row and also add after that. So um, you can also add 
um, the rows by clicking the insert item here. So I'm going to show you another form um, that has the picture buttons here to replace uh, those widgets. So as you can see, it is more um, it is more user friendly. And if I click on the add button here, it will add a new um, row here. And if I delete that, um, click that button there, it will be deleted. So I'm going to show you now how to add those widgets or those uh, picture buttons in your form. So here in the lab tree package, uh, we have the end form, and I'm going to show you um, how the curious commands behind those feature uh, work. So here, um, okay, we're in a different view here. So let's uh, go to the expense report default view. And as you can see here, we've added the buttons here. Um, so to add picture buttons, you just need to um, go to the Home tab and click the Picture button here in the Control section. Okay, as you can see, the Picture button is now added. Um, click the Properties and uh, browse for the icon that you want to use for for that uh, buttons. So here in the package, we've also added these uh, add and delete icons. Uh, I just downloaded this from, uh, if you go to your Google uh, or, your, or your browser, you can search for iconsape.com and you can download in any from any site where um, you can, uh, you can search for other icons in other sites, but this is where I normally download my icons. So yeah, you can use these pictures uh, in your forms. So yeah, so let's add the add button here and click apply. So as you can see, it's a bit um, it's a bit larger. So I we need to uh, resize that. Uh, in here in the size tab and click apply. So do the same for the uh, delete button there. So since we've already added that, uh, I'm going to show you now the rules behind those buttons. So as you can see um, in the add button here, I there's a rule here that uh, uses uses the insert command here, as you can see, it has the parent parameter as well as the child parameter and also the position. So for the parent, you're going to um, to get the X path of the parent group of your repeating group. So I'm going to show you that now. So here's our parent, uh, parent node, and then our child node will be the item here which is our repeating group. So uh, for the position parameter, we're going to, let's see, let's go back to the command. And uh, so as you can see here, the in the position uh, parameter, uh, we're using the count field here and adding, adding one to that. So as you can see, the count field here is a whole number. So it uses the function, the InfoPath function preceding sibling. So if you want to learn more about that, um, you can uh, browse this blog that uh, that was written by Greg Collins here. Um, he explained uh, here uh, about the preceding sibling and, and how that those functions work or, or how that function works in InfoPath. So, yeah, so um, just to summarize, the count is just for uh, detecting the current, uh, the current uh, number uh, of row or the row number of our, in our repeating group. So that's it for the insert command here.
For our delete uh, button, I've added a formatting formatting rule here that hides um, that hides the button if the if count is equal to one, meaning if um, if the the row number is equal to one, then it will hide the um, delete button here. So as you can see, you you, uh, you won't be able to see the delete button here in the first row. So the reason why we're adding that is for the users to, um, so users won't be able to delete all of the rows within our repeating uh, repeating group here. So uh, going back to our form, uh, to disable the default widget in the InfoPath form, you just need to disable this one, the, the, the checkbox allow users to insert and delete rows. So just uncheck that and click apply. So yeah, so that's about it. And yeah, so you can just use uh, icons to insert and delete rows in our uh, repeating group here. So another bonus in our lab here, if, if we try to browse in the document, uh, you're going to see a bonus part here where you can automatically insert a repeating row. So just to demo that to you, if let's say, let's just remove this first. And if we try to uh, tab out from the last column here. So I'm going to click my tab, uh, the tab key in my keyboard. And as you can see, it automatically add, added a row in our expense items here. So this is a really cool technique. If you want to add that to the form as well, you can go ahead and, um, and uh, follow the guide. So the guide is uh, very straightforward. You just need to um, to import some of the XML files and JS file in your form. So yes, um, that's all for the lab tree. Uh, do you do you have any other questions? That's a great job, Kirby. That, that's, I really love that technique of being able to tab out and having it automatically add a new row. That's really cool. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. We'll do a quick summary. And, and I think uh, Sri has one question, and that is regarding uh, whether you're using InfoPath Designer or, or not. Um, and I guess my response, Sri, would be, uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to be trying to move to using Forms, Forms Your Designer over the next uh, you know, a few months to a year, we, we still have to add that canvas editing ability. That's the main feature that's missing from the forms viewer designer today. Uh, you know, as you saw in the previous demos, you can create mappings, you can act, look at commands, you can actually create add rules using the forms viewer designer, or you can use the uh, InfoPath designer, but you'll want to kind of probably continue using InfoPath designer until we have that canvas layout and editing ability done later this year. Uh, and the reason for that is because every time you change it using a Forms Viewer Designer, you have to download the XSN because it, it automatically updates it in the browser in the Forms Viewer on your site. So to edit you know, the most recent version, you have to download the latest XSN to your, your desktop so you can right-click it and choose InfoPath Design. So I would just continue using the InfoPath Designer. You know, Microsoft has recently gone on record as saying that they're going to continue supporting it for a minimum of three more years, and that's for, for online. So the on-prem will be supported until spring of 2026. Even for online, it's going to be the end of 2022 before they're, they're saying they're not going to support it anymore for publishing to 365. Um, so hopefully I was able to answer your question. Um, so just to recap, um, Kirby, uh, Kirby, what Kirby just showed was, you know, obviously usability matters. The widgets that were in InfoPath required two clicks. Let's make it easier. Let's make it one click. And so those buttons that she showed uh, make it easy to quickly insert a delete. And in fact, you don't even have to click a button. You can just tab out of the last column and it automatically inserts a new row. 
So this is really much more usable, and there's lots of techniques like that that we can do now with with Forms Viewer because it has key rules, it has all these commands that we didn't have before. That's a quick summary. Any other questions on this uh, lab three, demo number four? Great job, Kirby. I'm going to switch back to you for the next one. You're on. Do you have audio, okay. Kirby? Oh, yeah, there we please go. let me know if you, now, if you can now see my screen. Yep, I can see it. So for lab four, I'm going to show you how you can generate a PDF copy of your form and uh, save form attachments to SharePoint. So this is the end form of, uh, of this lab. So I'm going to just put um, uh, some dummy data here. Um, and I'll attach a file receipt here and specify an, an amount. And once I hit submit, it should automatically create a PDF copy of our form. So let's wait for a few seconds here. A new tab. Okay, so as you can see, a new tab um, is opened. And as you can see, uh, the details are here as well as the receipt file. You're, you're able to see the image of our receipts here. So aside from that, it also, the form also uh, creates folder. So as you can see, I've uh, pre-added a document library here where, um, where the files are being stored. So if we click on that, um, a new folder, a new SharePoint folder is created by um, uh, a cool uh, Kuros command I'm going to show you later. So if we click on that, you're going to see that the uh, receipt that I just attached to the form is already uploaded to our SharePoint document library. And also, the PDF copy of our form. All right, so uh, so let's go to the end form, and I'm going to show you how to do that in uh, in our uh, sample form here. So if we go to the guide to our document here. Um, You'll, you'll see here that the prerequisites, so you're, you're going to need to create a, a document library called attachments. And yeah, that is, that is where we're going to upload the PDF copy of our form and also the, the attachments to, to our form, in our form. And also, um, here in our uh, end form, so when we hit submit, it will... As you can see here, we have a rule called submit at the bottom, and it will um, trigger this submit node under our form logic data source here. And if we go to our form uh, logic secondary data source and go to actions, um, you're going to see the submit node here. And this submit node calls the generate PDF node. So it also resides in the same um, node here under the actions. So here it is. So as you can see, um, this is where we're, we are uh, specifying those commands, the Kuros commands. So first, uh, what we are doing here is we're creating a folder. So we're calling it the attachments folder here in our main uh, data source. And we're giving it the report name. And next is um, the command, the Kuros command called create SharePoint folder. So this, um, this 
uh, heroes command allows users to create a folder in a SharePoint library or list. So we've used uh, three parameters here. First one is name, uh, the name of the attachments folder, and next is our site URL. So the site URL um, is under the config values here under the form logic secondary data source. So that's being populated on load. So jo Joanne already um, explained to you earlier about that, that it gets, uh, it uses the get input parameter to get the URL where the form currently resides. So next uh, parameter is the library. So this is the name of our library attachments. So that's it for the create SharePoint folder. And um, next is um, once the SharePoint folder is created, we want to upload the receipts to that folder. So we are now using another uh, helpful command here rules called the save to SharePoint. So the save to SharePoint allows to save files or images to a SharePoint document library. So it also returns a link to the newly created item to your form. So uh, there are two advantages why you should be why you should use save to SharePoint command in your forms. First is um, it provides users easy access to where the file is uploaded to in SharePoint by just uh, clicking the link in your form. And second, your XML size will be much smaller because we're saving out the actual file to SharePoint and not keeping it in your actual in your actual form, which means faster form opens. So here uh, in the Save to SharePoint, um, we've used uh, some of our parameters here. So we can also build this in our command builder if we want to. So let's go to our um, form template here and click the design button to re and it will direct us to the forms designer. So go to the command builder and search for save to SharePoint. And as you can see, um, the required fields here uh, are these, the URL or the SharePoint library URL, the expat of the attachment in our form. So let's go and uh, let's just uh, specify the site URL here. Okay, and then the X path to the picture or the file attachment. So the X path for that will be um, in here. Oh, not that. Uh, go to expense details, items, and then here, the files. So this is the um, the the expat to our uh, receipt file. So if you if we check that in our main data data uh, source here, let's navigate to that. So here we have the file. As you can see, it's pointing to our receipt control here, and it has a data type picture or file attachment. So under that uh, field, we also have this curals link and curals file name. So once uh, this, the, uh, the receipt is uploaded to SharePoint, it will then delete the actual file in the form and store the, the link of that um, of that receipt in the SharePoint uh, into the Curious link field here, and also store the file name. So that's the purpose of these uh, two attribute fields here. So next is going back to this one. Uh, since this uh, we're specifying an X path. We need to make this static. And next is, what else? I'm missing. Save to SharePoint. 
So we have the URL, the XPath, and also um, the clear here, the clear equals false. So, so the clear parameters here, so first of all, so uh, I've added the site to a URL, right, in the uh, command builder. And since we want the receipt to be uploaded to the folder within our document library, we need to specify the location of that folder. So we added the attachments here and the, um, the attachments fold folder here. And we're, what, we are concatenating that to build the URL for the save to SharePoint. For the clear parameter, um, this is actually um, needed do in want, this. Do you want me to talk to us, Kirby? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a, an interesting case here because we want to keep the images in the form until we PDF it. Uh, because then we can print out the images in uh, in the PDF and they can be at the bottom of the PDF as you saw earlier um, and then after they print the PDF then we're going to delete them uh, so normally what you'll do with an attachment if it's not an image is you'll just you won't have clear equals false you'll just use the default it will automatically remove the attachment reducing the size but in this case because we're also PDFing the form um, we want to upload the attachments, obviously, make sure that succeeds, and then generate the PDF, I believe, after that. Can you just verify, Kirby, that it is after that that we are generating the PDF to make sure that I'm not just saying something incorrect here? Can you please repeat yeah, that, Patrick? Sorry. Yeah, you're right. So right there underneath it says render form as PDF. So, so that's exactly what we're doing is we're... Yeah. We correct. actually added the clear parameter here to not to disable the deleting of the file or the receipt in the form so that we can add that and show show it in the PDF. So the reason cool. why we're, yeah. <laughs> the reason why we're, we're um, uh, it is displaying in the PDF, the receipt image is because we, we added that uh, parameter in the save to SharePoint. So it's not actually uh, deleting the receipt in our form. So we should probably uh, add a rule. We should probably add a rule at the end there after the PDF is generated to do that, shouldn't we? I think we, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe we're deleting it somewhere else. But but definitely for the second benefit to reduce the size, we should have it, you know, set the file to the attachment to blank after we upload it and after we render the PDF, right? Um. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So, yeah, so because remember the second reason why we're doing this save attachment is to reduce the size of the XML, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we don't, if we don't remove it, we're not getting that benefit. Yeah, right. So, so we should be removing it somewhere downstream. Do you know where, where it is getting removed? Um, since we have this parameter, um, users can have a, it, it, it is becoming an optional for the users to use that um, feature of deleting the file in within the form. Cool. I'm just wondering if we have the delete somewhere else in the form, you know, after we... No, we don't have, we okay. don't delete the receipt. Yeah. But we're only showing it if there's no link. So we actually show the link Trying to remember here because I remember when they opened it the second time. There's you, you can't see the image, but you can click on the link to see the image from the library. Is that because we have a um, I'm trying to think maybe it's a separate view? We should definitely add a delete for the image once it's uploaded and we've generated a PDF. We don't need to have the image in the form anymore, so we should probably have a rule that removes it after the. Um, the PDF has been form. generated. Yeah, right there. Yeah. After after that form file equals result, mm -hmm. we should probably just, assuming that command succeeds, we should have another yeah. rule here that just deletes the deletes the attachments. Yeah, correct. Cool. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So after saving the attachment to uh, to the to SharePoint, 
uh, we need to render the form as PDF. So um, in here, we're using the render form command. And the render form command has these parameters, the format, which is the PDF, uh, the views um, that we're going to use, which is called the PDF. So I'm going to show you uh, where that is. So here, uh, we're actually rendering um, this view instead of the default view here. So this is what's your this is what you're seeing in the PDF copy of the form. Okay. So next is what else? Sorry to interrupt, so, Curry, but I want to make one more okay. comment on that view. It, it's the reason why we have a separate view is we want to add a page break. And I think if you can highlight. I think it's in the repeating section down below there where we have the images right at the top of that repeating section. I believe we have inserted a page break where it says receipts there. I believe it's right somewhere in there. There's a page break. Do you know where it is? Is it after the um, first image? No. Yeah. So the page break is important because the images, we don't know how big the images are. So we want to render one image per page and not have it cut off at the end. So we're using a technique here to uh, control the the height of the image so that it doesn't exceed the height of the page that's generated. And then each image is on a separate page. So when you do have images, you can do that. If you have some other document, you can't actually create PDF if you attach a Word document or a Excel document because the, the PDF generation doesn't actually go into that document. and generate a PDF from within Word or Excel. So it's kind of limited in that, in that regard, but if you have images, you can definitely add them and you can just put a page break above them and that way the pagination will look good in your PDF. Sorry again. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so after rendering the form, um, we need to uh, save that to another um picture field here called form file and the result will be uh, in the cadaver rules result result so as you can see here we're um storing that result into our form file field here so next is we're going to um save that pdf file um and specifying the x path of that form file so with the same URL uh, parameter value here. So yeah, uh, that's it for uh, the, the PDF generation for, for this expense report form. So next part of the lab is, um, is focused on the, the generating PDF uh, from a list form. So since there's no way uh, to print more than one item from a list form, uh, we added uh, new parameters in the render form command in our latest uh, form viewer version. So this is possible by using the parameters template name and um, DS name. So if we go back to our forms designer here, uh, Okay, so let's uh, search for the render form. And here are the new parameters. First is the template name, where we uh, specify the template that we want to use for rendering um, the data, and also the data connection where we're going to retrieve the uh, repeating or our repeating uh, data. So here, uh, I'm going to show you how that works. So we have here our expense reports list, um, which is our parent list. And if we click on, say, this one, okay, let me just go back. Let's. Um, click a new one here. Okay, 
So this is our expense report uh, and it's querying our list items here. And we have here a button called print. So if we click on that, it will generate a PDF for us that contains uh, these repeating items here just by going to our list form. So, okay, there we go. So as you can see here, this is the uh, PDF that or the form that was uh, submitted by Joanne earlier. So it is using a view, it is using uh, a view of our end form lab here. So I'm gonna show you how that, uh, that works in the end form of our list form. So uh, in this document, uh, it's going to show you how that you need to modify your list form. Uh, you need to customize that in, in InfoPath. And um, you can use the design that we used in the sample list form. And next is, um, so here's our list form, sample list form. Um, in, the, in this print button, it actually has two rules here. One is the get expense report XML. So the get expense report XML is for changing the connection of this um, data connection, data connection here called expense report XML. So here I've added a an XML uh, XML file called expense report XML. So that came from so that came from our um, end form here. I've extracted the source files of that end form and added that to this folder, sample fo folder. And uh, I copied these uh, template.xml file. And we need this uh, file to get the main schema of our expense report form. So once we have that XML, we can Korea, I think we lost audio. I just, um, if you're still there and you can hear me, you might need to reset your audio. I, I, can uh, anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, Patrick. Okay. Oh, great, you're back. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly jump in. I know it might be confusing for people, but um, Forms here does support list forms, and what you're seeing here is a list form template, which is different from the expense report template that we've been showing. So we actually created a separate list form template on the list and as part of the print what it does is it, it actually uses the um, XML from the first expense report template that we showed uh, so they can print out repeating data and that's why she's um, pulling in the XML that was generated or saved when the first expense report is submitted in order to set up the data connection correctly with the schema you have to do this technique where you pull the template XML out of the the source files uh, for the you know, from the previous template, so that you have a valid data connection, and then she just changes the, the connection here to pull in the specific XML from the library corresponding to the the list items that she's on. Sorry, Kirby, I just wanted to clarify for people. Thanks. To add a little more. Thanks, Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, so we're just passing the ID value here from our main data source, uh, the expense report ID, as well as the resource name to retrieve uh, the corresponding uh, expense report XML from our library. So once that's retrieved, um, here we can now have the repeating items um, within our secondary data source here. So you can, as you can see, the, the item repeating group here is also included. So once we retrieve that, we have retrieved that, uh, we will now use the render form command again and if we copy that to uh, into a notepad you're going to see that it's using the format again pdf and um, it's specifying the name of our end form here so so make sure that um, that form is also uploaded to forms viewer 
and it's um, going to use the data connection expense report XML for the data and for the views it's going to borrow uh, the PDF view of our end form here uh, the end form for the lab form and also uh, the output page 64 so yeah, that's how you generate the PDF within a list form. That's very complex. I, I know that uh, people may be like rolling their eyes at this point, but we actually have customers using this today because they have data in a list that they want to print out. And you know, it's, it's actually an interesting scenario because you, you have several situations where you're taking data from a regular form that has repeating data, mapping it to a list, and then they're accessing the same they're going into the list to do something, and they they're you know up you know opening an item, and they want to be able to print from the list as opposed to the library. So this is a scenario that does come up quite a bit. I just want to quickly summarize, and I want to make one comment here about this technique. Um, in both cases, the PDF was being generated on the uh, in the browser as a new pop-up. So we popped up a new tab in the browser, we showed the PDF, and then the user can download it. We also attached the PDF to the form and upload it to the library. So you can do both of those today. You may be wondering, well, I don't like the pop-up. I don't want to do that. I just want to have the attachment saved in the form or to the library. We have that feature coming in 4.2. So today, when you do render form, you're always going to have that pop-up. It's going to pop the PDF up. And then, of course, you can save it in your form as well. But if you don't want that pop-up because it's too disconcerting, there will be a, a way in 4.2 coming out in a week or two at the end of August, so you won't have to have that PDF pop-up um, be the default. Uh, so quickly to summarize uh, what we just saw there, um, you know, it's important to upload attachments. And this attachment that we showed with the photo is a great example. Save to SharePoint command has been in forms here for years, just with that one command, you can take a photo from your phone, you can attach it and upload it to a library and replace it with a link. There's no code required. I mean, there's that command, but there's no code, right? It's just a rule. Uh, so that that's a really wonderful feature that still does not exist in Power App in the same way today. Power Apps requires a little bit of code. They're going to fix that this year, and they're going to give us a way to do upload a photo from Power App without having to write code. Um, but we've, we've had that in Forms here for years. So it's very easy to, to access it. Um, make sure you delete the attachments after you upload them. But before, um, but before that, you should obviously generate the PDF if you want to print the photos. The, um, the library gives you a way to archive those data. So if you want to edit the attachments without opening the form, they can do that. And um, very easy to do. So great job, Kirby. I'm going to um, switch back to you then. We also showed this this new technique on the list forms. Um, so we have one demo to go, and then we're done with the demos. And uh, you guys can do the labs, um, or choose to wait uh, and do it you know, as homework. But uh, we'll do a quick recap and get your takeaway. We're going to do one more demo, and then we'll ask everyone that's still here to to give us their feedback for the the class today. Um, Kirby, I'm going to switch back to you. Okay. Okay, so um, this is the last lab for day one. So I'm, I'm going to show you another technique on using the transform QROS command when you need to submit multiple forms and don't want to reopen the form in every submit. So I'm going to show you now how that works. So let's uh, fill out this expense report with dummy data. And as you can see here, there's a new button called Submit and New. And once I hit that, Um, okay, so it is generating our PDF there, and as you can see, the the fields have been reset, and um, 
you can now fill out again the form and submit another uh, new expense report. So this is a, a very helpful technique if you want to um, do sub subsequent um, submits in one form. So you, you don't need to create a new form again, go back to the, your library and click new there. So this is really a very cool technique. So um, I'm going to show you uh, the rule behind that feature. So I'm opening the end form of this lab. And as you can see, I've added the new button here. And this is doing the same, uh, or this is uh, triggering the same rules as the submit button here. But the difference is that um, in the submit uh, section or submit rule here, it has uh, the curious command transform. So, so if we go to our design uh, forms designer here and search for transform, So it's going to show you the required um, parameters here. So the, the required will be the XSLP file. So the XSL file, uh, it's a file format for uh, for defining, it's for defining how to transform one XML format to another XML format. So we're going to use the upgrade dot xsl file here so um, in order to uh, to get this file or to show this file to you i have exported the source files of our um, lab or our form here and as you can see it has the upgrade dot xsl file here so just that jump in again i just want to just make one comment here Kirby. this is important for people to know that Every single form template that you have will have an upgrade at XSL in it. So we're just reusing the file that gets automatically generated when you create a form. This this upgrade at XSL file that she's showing in the template source files, that's, that's automatically generated by InfoPath when you create a form. So every single form template will have it. We're just reusing it because it's a lot simpler than having to create your own XSL T. Thanks, thanks, Patrick, for the additional info. So um, this uh, upgrade XSL file, it handles the presentation between the old and the new version of your form, form template. So if you try to add a new field in your schema in an existing form template and try to resave, you will see that the upgrade.xsl file will be created once source files are expo exported locally. So that is going to be the our um, XSLD. Uh, and then for the source file, let's, have, let's go back to our command builder here. So another uh, parameter that uh, we used is the source file. So this is going to be the source uh, XML format for, uh, for that feature. So we're going to use here the XML, oh, the template.xml. And again, this is being, uh, once we export the source files of our form, you're gonna see the template.xml file there. So this is just, uh, so this is the blank form that InfoPath uses when creating an instance of our form template. So the reason why we're, uh, the, the fields are being reset it's because we're using this um, source file here. So for the destination uh, destination data source, uh, oh, Can sorry. I make the one comment here, Kirby? I just want to make one more comment, and that is that template XML is important because if you have default data in your, in your form template, if you've got values that are set when the form is open for new, then those values exist in template.xml, and, and that's actually another great reason why we're using that as our base. Um, sorry. Yeah, so next parameter we used is the destination path. So we 
we're going to use uh, the root of our main data source. So we normally use these characters to indicate the root node in our main data source. So next uh, parameter we used is the exclude root. So we um, we added the the true value here. So it omits it. This parameter omits the outermost element of the result and just puts its content to its destination. So we use the exclude root parameter as true. Uh, practically every time we use the transform command. So once you're done with the uh, command, just copy that to, to clipboard and paste it in here. Sorry. So that's how you generate uh, this um, transfer, transform command here. And yeah, you can use that um, in your forms as well. One more quick comment, if you don't mind, is, is it go, if you can go back to the designer for a second. There, mm -hmm. there is a difference between, uh, you click on that command, um, set fields value on the right there where you were. You go to submit and then, um, yeah, click on that. So it's really important to note that we're not clicking on the FX here. We're just pasting it into the value. Yeah. So it, it's sometimes if you click on FX and paste it in, you, you won't, you can't do it because it won't, it won't take it. So for these commands, all of these curls commands, if there's no, um, you know, if you're going to use a dynamic parameter, you will go into FX and you'll use concat. Uh, and I think you saw that earlier, we have a save SharePoint command. When you have a, a field that you want to use in the command, you'll use the concat, the name of the command, and then, you know, with, in, in quotes, and then comma, the field that you want to include. In this case, there's no field that we're adding. It's just all hard-coded static text. So we can just paste it in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for the for Lab Five, Patrick. Great. I'm going to share my screen again, and we are wrapping up here with our demos. Thank you very much, Kirby. Those were wonderful. I really love how you show um, you've got your demos really well down. You should show the results first and then show how you did it, and then refer to the, the PDF handouts. And Kirby and Joanne and Don have worked really hard to create these labs for you this week. We've revised a lot of content from the January training. Um, so I want to, uh, you know, this, this training class is because of their effort. We, we could not do it if they hadn't done such a wonderful job. Um, the What you just saw was this submit new or save and new, whatever you want to call it. The benefit is less time to submit multiple forms. They don't have to reopen it. And it's very easy to do this with out of box um, stuff from your form. I mean, it's kind of tricky to add this transform command with those things, but you saw how to do it. That same command is actually used for every single form. So that, that command is not specific to Kirby's form. It's the same command that you would use for every single form because the upgrade's gonna be the same, the template's gonna be the same, the exclude root node is going to be the same. So there's no difference in that command with any other form that you have. Just keep that in mind. Um, so that wraps up the the day one demos. Uh, we've gone through a bunch of demos. We've showed how to do these new techniques with printing from a list form. We have a lot of new techniques tomorrow, but um, let's let's take a, a moment to just share a quick takeaway. I, we're gonna I'm gonna stay on the call um, to help you if you have if you want to do the labs. Um, and you know you can do the labs in any order you want because we have included N labs, so you can jump in the middle, use the N lab from the previous lab as your starting point, or you can just start from scratch and build everything uh, with the initial sensor report form. My hunch is it's going to take you probably an hour to go through the labs today, so we're running a little bit over today. We're at about 20 minutes over where we really want to be because we want to give you the time to do the labs. Um, but um, anyway, <laughs> we had more stuff that we wanted to demo. Uh, let's quickly uh, go around the table here. We lost Justin. He was busy with something else. But let's quickly share any takeaways. So if you saw something in today's demos that you liked, that you wanted to use, or if you saw some technique that you hadn't seen before that you thought was cool, let's quickly share the takeaway. And, and actually, let's go from the bottom up this time. So we'll start with Sri if you're, if you're ready.
Hi, uh, Patrick. Yeah. Um, I want how. I mean, I liked how the uh, um, Qrolls commands were or use i mean that's pretty new for me so most i thought most i think most of it was new for me and uh, i think doing the labs will help me a bit more to concretize what i have learned today um the, uh, and also like uh, the tabbing out um i i know users are like one click of button they want everything to happen. So the tabbing out uh, from when you insert items and especially um, when I know in Footpath when you had the uh, add command, I mean, add a new line, you had the wording was like, it was very technical and not very user friendly. And this one's like the, just with the icons, it, it really, really um, would be very, very user friendly. That's what I'm liking about the uh, whole, thing, um, whole thing and uh, yeah, so so I, I think those would really be helpful for the forms I create usually here. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. That's great to hear, and I'm glad you're here today in the class. And uh, please don't hesitate to, to ping us when you have any um, questions during the labs this week, even mm -hmm. if it's after hours. We, we are 24-7 coverage mm -hmm. here. Um, Shane, um, you're next up. Anything new? I know you've seen a lot of these techniques before, but did you see anything new? Yeah, this the the submit and new. Um, I really like that. In fact, I wrote a note down. I've got a project that I'm working on coming up here that I'm going to use that in. So that, I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's great to hear. And uh, Chris Miller, uh, uh, you're also in the same kind of boat as Shane. You've done a lot of forms. You've seen a lot of the techniques. Anything new? Um, no, but uh, again, reinforcing uh, certain things like the print, the uh, PDF and stuff like that, which we use in some of our instances, um, you know, some of the older techniques were different and, and you know, <laughs> moving to the new techniques is probably the better way to go. So we're, uh, you know, anxious to build that back into our forms. Yeah, and if you don't want to pop that PDF, just, you know, keep in mind that 4.2 is is we're going to ship that pretty much this month. Probably the end of the month, we'll have a new online version out. We'll have a new on-prem build for you. We haven't actually shipped an on-prem build for 4.1, so we're kind of doing 4.1 and 4.2 for on-prem in that one release here at the end of this month, and we're also updating the online version. So you'll get a new on-prem bits uh, that you can use, and that will have the command that does not force you to pop up a PDF from the client if you use that command. I think you might, you guys might want that. I'm thinking back to your yeah. forms here. Great. Well, great. Thanks for being here. Really glad to have uh, someone with your skill set on the call. And and Chris, for us, same to you. But you're, this is your first training. Any feedback for us? Anything that you saw that you liked? Uh, lots of stuff I saw that I liked, but um, I'm just happy to kind of absorb everything. So thanks for putting these on. Cool. And did we go too fast, too slow? Should we do something different tomorrow? Uh, no, you guys are doing good. Keep keep doing what you're doing. Cool. Great to hear. Uh, Caroline. Yeah, I think the class accomplished um, my goal of being a refresher. The PDF, print to PDF was new for me, something that I think I'll take advantage of. Awesome. And last but not least, Brock. Uh, it looks like you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. We have an audio issue with Brock's mic. Sorry, Brock. Maybe you can chat. Kirby, can you still hear me? Yes, Patrick. Okay, but we, we can't hear Brock, right? You can't hear him, right? No. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Brock. Um, yeah, if you want to just chat it or tell us when you get your audio working that you're trying again still can't hear you um, so just we're, we're done with the class today like I said I'm gonna stop the recording and I'm just gonna hang out here I will go get we'll take a break I'll take a break and go get some water but I'll be here to answer questions so if you do have if you can repurpose the remainder 30 minutes that we had scheduled and do several, several of those labs and I'll be here to answer any questions but also feel free to drop off uh, we will be doing this again tomorrow. So tomorrow we've got 
uh, quite a lot of stuff to look at. In fact, um, let me just give you a quick preview here. We are going to be showing you that new security technique for um, authenticating external users. So this is a benefit in lots of different ways. It's a benefit because it's lower licensing costs for you. It's also a benefit because it's way more secure than using a login. And that's a key, a key demo for tomorrow. We've got a, a reusable template part that you can add your forms to add this. It does require a Twilio account, but the Twilio text messages are literally a cent or so per per text. I think it's between one and four cents, depending on. I mean, they're free up until a thousand, and then after that, it's between one and four cents per text. It's a great technique for uh, engaging external users, bringing them into your uh, your forms in a way that's very very secure. And then in today's world, security really matters. And then the second thing is we're going to be going through a list of a grab bag of five different techniques that we like to add to every single form, including a new one, which is how to auto log out users. And we'll be showing you that uh, as part of the second set of demos tomorrow. So lots of really good stuff. And keep in mind that we do have uh, four days this week. We're going to be doing more stuff on day three and day four, and there's new stuff on those days as well. So if you do have time, please don't hesitate to join us. If you can't make it, that's not a big deal because we're going to be taping this and sending you the video recording as well and all the lab content. If you didn't get the lab content, let me know. It looks like Chris uh, Chris Forrest did not receive it. I'm sorry, Chris, about that. Did anyone else not receive it? I think that, Kirby, you sent it out to everyone. We'll have to figure out why Chris didn't get it. But um, if you yeah. didn't get the package, did uh, Caroline, did you get the package this morning? I did. Thank you. Okay, good. Glad to hear that. So we'll have to look at the, your email, Kirby, to make sure that we have the right BCC list. Um, obviously, the meeting request wasn't BCC. We couldn't do that. There's no technology in Outlook for BCC people on meeting requests. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, and Brock, if you did have feedback and you wanted to just chat that in uh, to everyone, that would be great. But but no need to if you don't want to. So I'm going to take a quick break here. Um, Kirby, please go to go to bed. It's late there, and thank you so much for the wonderful effort that you and Joanne and Don put together to get this uh, training off the ground today. Awesome job. Um, and I'm just going to basically be here for those of you who want to stick around and do those labs uh, to answer any questions you have. But like I said, if you're, you know, you, you want to do the labs later, um, or feel free to log off and we'll see you again tomorrow at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific and that's 11 a.m. Eastern. So I'll take a quick break and hope you guys have a great day. If you want to stick around, that's great too. I'll be here for another half an hour after I get back from my break. <laughs> Thanks, Kirby. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick.